So this next to me here is my Angelfish Aquarium, which you cannot see at all. <laughs> well, you can if I just completely adjust the ISO. I mean, that's, yeah, that's a little bit better. We can still see some stuff now. Probably about how I'm seeing it as well. Now, why is this? This right here is the reason why. The whole surface is covered in floating plants, red root floaters, and many, not so many, water lettuce, to be honest. Now, I recently did an update video on doing all the maintenance on this tank that's next to it. It's all grown back absolutely beautifully now, just at the right level, completely green again. And a lot of you really enjoyed that video as well, like just chilling out and doing some maintenance on a tank. So I'm gonna do it on that one and get it looking really, really good again. So why is there so many floating plants in this tank? Oh my goodness, they are gorgeous. Look at those beauties, blood red. Yeah, so we'll see in a minute that underneath all of these floating plants, there's quite a lot of red plants. So the idea was put some red root floaters in, see how well they do. Some tanks, not so great, not so vibrant and red, but in this tank with this lighting, they just go absolutely amazing. Look at the thickness of that. So what's the point of the floating plants anyway? Well, they are very, very good for pulling out nutrients in the water column to grow. Oh my goodness, just look at that. Just look at it. So yeah, the root bit obviously sits in the water and then the leafy bit that actually grows is exposed to the atmosphere, which means it can grow really, really quickly and have a really strong supply of nutrients as well from underneath in the water column, from the fish poop and like plants breaking down, anything really. So yeah, I sort of use this, this tank as a way of growing these floating plants. I put them in this bag and then I take, take them to my fish shop. Um, I can then swap them out for some fish. What's great then is that they can make a little bit of extra money as well, but also it means that like people in the local area actually have access to red root floaters that are fully grown in. Now they might sort of change a little bit when you put them in your aquarium, but assuming you've got a really good setup, then they should thrive. There's no reason why you shouldn't be able to transfer them from one to the other. They might sort of adapt slightly to the different lighting conditions, but they should work. I mean, why wouldn't they work? It's just a plant at the end of the day. And again, lots of plants look very different in everyone's aquariums. Just different lighting levels, different types of LED lights with, you know, if you've got a full RGB light, you tend to get a lot better reds in your plants anyway, mainly just because there's more LEDs, so the light intensity tends to be a lot higher. Now I'm trying to keep the red root floaters separate here from the floating water lettuce. We'll get to that in a minute. And I know that not everyone it's a fan of floating plants. I mean, you see a lot of these sort of high-tech scapes set up and they don't really have any in them at all. Um, I just really, really like them. I pretty much have them in every tank. It cuts down massively on all the maintenance you need to do because there's far less chance of algae just because they're using so many nutrients. I mean, this, I, I took all of these plants out of, not all of them, a good 90% of them out of here. What, it's gonna be, three weeks ago and it's completely covered the whole lot again. And this is quite interesting, look. So away from the light, it's more of a sort of greeny colored leaf. Still got reds underneath though. And then right underneath the light is way more sort of vibrant red. And you can see the light's there. So it sort of travels down like that direction. So you've got this strip in the middle where it's way more vibrant red than the rest. Like I say, a lot of reds in plants comes down to light intensity. And that's really showing here. One thing I do love about red root floaters and water lettuce though, is that you can just come in and grab clumps of it quite easy. I've stopped using duckweed because you can't do what I'm doing now. It just makes an absolute mess everywhere. And we're finally starting to see some light in the tank and you can really see the colors on the angels just below. So I've got two big bags full, well, not full, but two big bags. I'm gonna put too many in it, it'll just sort of squish it all. And uh, the guys at the shop can like divide this up into portions and they fetch a pretty penny, to be honest. There we go, now we're starting to see into that aquarium and look at these roots from the, from the water lettuce. Absolutely crazy. I'm gonna remove some of those obviously as well. Now it's called mini water lettuce, but to be honest, look at the roots on that. It's called mini water lettuce, but let's face it, it's not that mini after it grows. But it does, it does stay quite small for quite a long time and it's always sending out new babies. So all you've got to do is when you get the big ones is just sort of take them out. And that's what I'm doing here. I don't want to remove everything because obviously I need more to be able to grow again so I can take more back. But we're cutting down on a lot of plants here, which is brilliant. I'm trying to get the red root floaters off. Try and keep them separate. Yeah, these two plants are definitely my favorite floating plants. I like Amazon frogbit as well, but 
I just find that it can be a little bit temperamental and you can have like a whole thing full of it and then all of a sudden they all just start dying off. Whereas I found these two plants just to be like bulletproof. Not that I've ever shot them, but yeah. It's a strange saying for non shooty at things. That's, that's not English. <laughs> Oh, there we go. That is now so much better and we can, you know, actually see into the aquarium. I'm going to give the glass a bit of a scrape. It's not too bad because obviously there wasn't a lot of light down there, but there's a little bit of scum on it. So I've got my trusty razor scraper. Now this is definitely going to dust the water up. I'm just using this at the moment to scrape off the mineral deposits because it does it instantly. If you try to wipe this, it, it never goes and you can actually hear it. It's also putting the minerals back in the water as well, to be honest, because Obviously, they're all part of a balanced system. Now I've got to go steady at the bottom here because there's quite a bit of mulm look and as I come up, it sort of flicks it about. I'm not going to remove that mulm. It's all part of this ecosystem and it's obviously working very, very well. All the fish are so healthy, so there's no need to start removing stuff from the substrate surface. Eventually that mulm's gonna work its way into the sand and just become extra nutrients for all the plants anyway. Now the plants, as you can see, are a little bit more sparse. I did have a big chunk of plants in this section here, but it was just getting way too much. Um, the lotus though, looking insanely good. Yeah, I have to say, I'm a, I'm a little bit surprised at that because there's literally no light. Well, there is now, but there wasn't any light coming down here. Just the tiniest hint. And that explains why if we come over to this side of the aquarium, the ultranamphora down here is, I mean, it's not in the greatest spot, it's right beneath this branch. So I might actually move that, but that is really struggling. I mean, that definitely requires a lot more light than it was getting. Basically, I've just left it, at, look at the angels. So nice, especially under the Chihiros, it does make reds and oranges. If you put the setting right, that is, just pop like crazy. Look at the red on the neons as well. That is amazing, right? But yeah, this time I think I've just, I let them grow too much. Uh, before I harvested them, so I need to keep on top of that. I need to take them out when it's sort of like 75% covering the surface rather than 100%. It's probably 110% the surface because they were starting to double up on each other as well, but at least we've got an amazing yield. And I think now's a good time to actually check out the filter on the tank. It's had the pre-filter cleaned a few times. It's got like a section, I'll show you in a second. It's got a section that like instantly takes out a lot of the chunks. So inside the actual filter chamber, it's probably pretty clear, I assume. It might not be, but I'm gonna get the whole thing out and just sort of check it out. It's been, what, six months now? Something like that since this was done? No, maybe a little bit less, five months. That's probably about the sort of time you should check your filter to make sure it's okay. I mean, by the time you're checking it, you might as well clean it anyway, to be honest. So the filter that I've got is an Awaze Biomaster 250, so the smallest one. Is that the plug? No. Nope. Is this the plug? Yeah, that's the one. Take out the pre-filter section. I need a bucket. So yeah, the pre-filter section just slots out like that. It will drip. And I can take off the top as well. And then I can remove the whole basket. There's all the canister components. And then here's the pre-filter. This will be interesting. Oh yeah, that definitely needs a clean look. <laughs> oh, a lot of gunk in there. A lot of it seems like organic material. No, it doesn't. It's full of poop. <laughs> so to clean this, we, uh, we want to use, well, legend has it. <laughs> we want to use non-chlorinated tap water. Now the chlorine in our taps in the UK is not actually that much. And I've done it plenty of times before. I've just cleaned a filter with tap water and it's been absolutely fine. But some people say that it causes problems. So we're going to do it the proper way. I have heard like, contrasting arguments. Apparently it's long exposure to chlorine that kills off any beneficial bacteria. So if you was to like leave it soaking in tap water until like a day, apparently that's what kills it. Just rinse it under the tap, allegedly. I'm not saying this is true, but it's what I've heard as well. Um, just rinsing stuff under the tap doesn't actually kill off the, the, the bacteria. But we're gonna do it the proper way because otherwise the internet will explode. So I've got a couple of buckets here with tank water. I'm just gonna slide those out. Oh. Now the Awaze filter inlets holes are quite small and uh, everyone started drilling holes, like bigger holes in them. So that it increases the flow rates because obviously once the pre-filter gets clogged up, it slows right down and you get bubbling inside the, the, uh, the actual filter itself. Now Awaze said, don't do that. You're, that's not what it's designed to do. And then released a new tube that had bigger holes. So I'm gonna drill the holes. <laughs> 
Now, obviously, this completely voids any warranty. There we go, look, just a little bit of a size increase, not too much. Now, you can obviously buy this little pipe, the new upgrade one, I expect as well, if you don't want to do it the cowboy way like me, but yeah. And yes, I did just drill all that with a Phillips screwdriver head. <laughs> so yeah, we know that the sponges are completely filthy. When, I know this because when I squeeze them, they don't even come back to shape for ages. But you know, that's why we're doing the cleaning, isn't it? What about internals though of the canister? Okay, so the top finest mesh. It's pretty good actually, yeah. I mean, the, the pre-filter's definitely doing its job. It could do with a clean up though, so I will give it a squeeze. Might as well whilst we're here. I'm not gonna to touch any of the beneficial bacteria. And what about the coarser sponge? The coarser sponge is fine, I don't need to touch that. I'm not gonna waste time unnecessarily. What I will do though is pour out all the water from this section, because there's a load. Yeah, it's quite grubby. Okay, that's the filter. Fill back up again. And we are on. It's gonna just spray a load of gunk for a little bit, but that's, that's normal. It's just the stuff that was settled in the pipes and that. It's all good, it's all good for the aquarium. So whilst I was waiting for the tank to clear up after all that gunk from the filter, I took the floating plants to Maidenhead Aquatics in Taunton where I usually go, and I got a load of new fish. I had a good chat as well with Martin, the manager there. And it looks like I might be going back there a little bit more in the future, hopefully, fingers crossed. You're definitely happy though for me to swap out um, the floating plants for some fish. So we've got three different types of fish here, perfect to put in our new eco, I say new, they're like several weeks old now, fully settled in. So we can put some fish in here and hopefully be able to use them quite soon in new setups. So let's take a look at what we've got then. We have got in this one two red dwarf grammys. Now, sometimes they can be a little bit temperamental. I mean, they're being bred quite extensively with high colouring, and for that reason, sometimes health wise, you can struggle. I've struggled with them before. So I've got two here, a nice clean tank. I'm just going to sit them in there and just see how they do. Next to them, I have got, and they're not showing up great at the moment because obviously they've been in a bag, but we've got red tailed Respora in here. They're awesome looking in the shop. Nice and green sort of line going down and with a bright red tail right at the back. So they'll look good in no time. And then the show pieces. These are rosy barbs, a really good size and already great color. And they've just come out of the bag. They're going to go insane. I'm going to give them a couple of hours and show you the coloration. It's so good. So it's now a few hours later, and as you can see, the coloration on all the fish is popping really, really well. Let this guy come out into the light a little bit more. Really, really vibrant. Look at that, look at that blue sort of sheen on that one. I think that's like a dominant male, and the other one's being submissive, so I think these two are gonna get along fine. But yeah, those colors look great. And then the red tail respawns as well, look. They've, their colors are really popping. They've got that red tail at the back, but look at that nice green stripe that's sort of flows all the way through them. I think that looks fantastic. I've actually never seen these fish before, so I saw them in the shop, I was like, oh yeah, I've got to have them. And it looks like we've got some full on sort of breeding behavior with the uh, rosy barbs. They're a little bit freaked out at the moment by me coming close, uh, but <laughs> when I was sat away from them, they were quite chilled, but I think they're expecting feeding maybe? I don't know, There's, that looks like breeding behavior going on to me right now. <laughs> but they're not gonna be in this tank for too long. I've got a really cool setup plan for them. Of course, I'm saying breeding behavior, but I don't actually know how to sex these, to be honest. I'm gonna look that up in a second. They could all be male and they could be doing a bit of a territorial dispute. But you know, there's no nipping, to be fair. There's just a lot of fast swimming. So I just looked it up and it says that the females don't have as much red coloration and are quite a lot more plump. Now, and the, and the males go a bit more streamlined. So like that one there looks definitely like a male, lots of red, 
darker colors, darker fins, quite sort of torpedo-like. And then this one is very plump and round, and to me looks more like a female. So yeah, apparently it's harder to sex when they're young, but these guys are a good size. So I think that's making it like, that's definitely a male, isn't it? It's gotta be. Right, so back to the angelfish tank. Now, <laughs> cleaning out the filter actually did something quite funny to the whole thing. You can see there, look, it's looking quite sort of grubby. There's lots floating around. And if you look down the bottom, all, most of the, the mold has now gone. So cleaning the filter and drilling those holes has massively increased the flow rate, which as a result, meant that all the moments just got sort of blown up into the water. So I've added this power head here. Power head? Yeah, it's a power head. Mini internal filter sort of thing. It's pretty powerful actually. Um, and I've just added a load of white sort of filter floss in there as well, just to sort of polish the water and pick up all that mommy bits, which, you know, I actually quite liked it. It's very, very clean looking now, isn't it? But um, yeah, I don't want it all floating around the water column either. So we'll just get it out. It's obviously gonna come again. A lot of it is from the um, bristlenose plecos, just chewing all of the wood. And it's like poo wood <laughs> that drops down and goes everywhere. But yeah, I'll just let that clean a little bit more and then uh, we should be good. So the tank is now mostly cleared. It's time to top that water level up. It's a little bit, uh, little bit low. Now I don't do what you might see on some other channels where they sort of bring it right up here. To me, that's too risky, too close to the surface. We're gonna get jumpers. I normally sit it about an inch to an inch and a half below the, the, top, the top of the tank. And for me, that stops any sort of jumping problems. I very, very, very rarely get jumpers in the tanks. You will probably count on one hand in the five years how many have jumped out. I mean, that said, if there is a particularly jumpy fish I know of, then I'll put a lid on the tank. But, you know, I don't really choose those kind of fish because I really don't like lids on tanks. It just means you just far less to do maintenance, I find, because it's an extra step to have to do. <laughs> So some of you might be wondering, what are these coming out of the top? This is Monstera, and what we did was placed them, well, slotted them in behind the wood that's all in the back area. So the roots and part of the stem part of the plant, actually, is all submerged in the water. Now this means there's even more filtration going on in the water because you can imagine the amount of nutrients these massive plants are pulling in. This leaf here, actually. This leaf is not looking too great. I might just give that a snip. It's not gonna bounce back. And by keeping it there is actually probably detrimental to the plant. This, this allow it, I, I guess if you snip that off, it'll stop sending nutrients to it. Or maybe it has already. I don't really know how it works. But obviously if we snip that, the rest of the plant's gonna be getting maximum amount of nutrients. These plants were nowhere near this big when I uh, first put them in, but now they're huge. <laughs> There's new leaves coming up all the time as well. Like, look at this. How nice is that? That's like a brand new leaf. That's a brand new one. This isn't brand new, this one, but it's quite new. Oh, they look so good. The two best plants to put out the top of your aquarium are Monstera for sure, and also Peace Lily. So look at this one here on my shell dweller tank. It's just flowering, looking absolutely amazing. As is this beast over here, which is like oh, well over a year old. It's just huge. I'm ducking backwards to get out of the way of it. Oh, and of course, we can't forget the uh, pophos as well. This is variegated pophos that we've got all along the back here of the Amazon puffer tank. And I've just noticed actually that the surface has got a bit of scum. That's because my surface skimmer has got stuck down there. Just did a water top up. There we go. That should clean the surface now really quick. And the pothos, like you can see here, can literally just sit in the water. So the root system is just hanging in the water there. And that's exactly the same as the piece lily as well. Like, look at that, just a clump of roots in the water. It doesn't mess the water up or anything. It doesn't damage the plant. And the plant just looks amazing, except for this flower that's died off and that one. But we've got a new one here, so all good. Oh, and I've just noticed up here, look, a little flower coming off the top of the dwarf sage. It's just sent out this sort of runnery thingy to the surface and it's flowering. That looks so nice. I'm going to leave that and there'll probably be more of it coming as well. This tank's doing really well. I've got the lighting on very bright, um, but there's enough of a cleanup crew that there's just no algae anywhere. And the fish looks so good as well. Okay, so we're looking good, but now I feel like there isn't enough floating plants. So I didn't actually remove all of them. I've got some down here still. So I'm going to replace some of the red root floaters over this section. Some really nice ones there, not too many, just, you know, these are all staying over there, that's fine. We'll keep some over in this area as well. Bit of the mini water lettuce as well. Will they stay there? Probably not. <laughs> so there we have it then, all the maintenance on this tank done. 
the, uh, the angelfish are now coming back out again. They didn't like that extra power head in there. It's way too much flow for them getting blown around. So they went around the back, but now they're coming back out. The water's clearing up a bit more nicely now. There's still a little bit of particles in the water column. Not a problem at all. That'll clear in its own time now. There's not just sort of tons of flow thrashing around. I actually turned the inlet inwards a little bit more towards the wood because it was just a little bit too much flow, just blowing all of that debris around. And now it's a lot more sort of natural looking. I tell you what, if I come in close like this and you can't see the edge of the tank, I wouldn't blame you for, for assuming we were filming underwater here. <laughs> anyway, I hope you guys have enjoyed this one and uh, yeah, I'll see you on the next one.